CIET NCERT presents Vowen Words Textbook in English for Class 11 Elective Course A note for the teacher Vowen Words is based on the new syllabus in English prepared in consonance with the spirit of the National Curriculum Framework 2005 This textbook is designed for students who have opted to study English as an elective subject at the higher secondary stage. The main objectives of this book are to help students read literary texts with pleasure and understanding, develop critical thinking and literary appreciation, develop a sensitivity to the nuances of language. Woven Words is an integrated book consisting of 3 sections, namely short stories poems and essays representative of literature in english from around the world most of the short stories included here are by contemporary writers there is a fair share of indian writing in english with mulkraj anand bhavani bhattacharya arundhati roy and jhumpa lahiri reflecting rural urban and diasporic experiences the rocking horse by d h lawrence and The Luncheon by Somerset Maugham add native English flavor to the collection and the Sherlock Holmes story would definitely appeal to youngsters looking for some thrill in reading Chekhov's The Lament a touching account of insensitivity to bereavement underscores the universality of the human condition The aim of this selection is to make learners approach reading as a pleasurable activity the stories are followed by exercises under four heads textual comprehension talking about the texts literary appreciation and language work these aim at fostering critical reading in the learners and instilling in them the confidence to express their responses the second head encourages learners to discuss their responses with each other in pairs or small groups the poetry selection representing different forms such as the lyric sonnet and ode reflects some of the pressing concerns of the contemporary world such as racial discrimination wol soinka's telephone conversation and w h oden's refugee blues marginalization of languages padma sachdev's mother tongue environmental issues dilip chitre's felling of the banyan tree manipulative politics Arun Kolatkar's satire Ajamil and the Tigers and sensitive comment on human relationships Nisim Ezekiel's for Elkana and Philip Larkin's coming Hawk roosting by Ted Hughes brings out the parallel in human behavior to the predatory instincts of animals while Sujata Bhatt's the peacock is a delightful visualization of the bird's colors and grace of movement Also included are all-time classics, pieces of enduring charm and appeal from Shakespeare, Wordsworth and Keats. Forms like the limerick and the haiku add variety to the reading experience and introduce an element of light humor and fun. The activities suggested for the poems are directed more at eliciting sensitive responses to the issues and the language rather than detailed textual comprehension. Difficult words have not been glossed as the aim is to encourage learners to make intelligent guesses or refer to the dictionary when they encounter unfamiliar terms. However, allusions to Greek mythology have been explained. A glossary of literary forms and terms has been provided at the end of the book. While the content of most of the essays provides for serious reading, Mark Twain's My Watch is a humorous piece that lightens the section Bertrand Russell's The Three Passions a short excerpt from his autobiography introduces students to a philosopher's perspectives on life and its primary concerns three of the essays are speeches recorded in writing John Ruskin's What is a Good Book an excerpt from Sesame and Lilies and E M Forster's piece on the elements of a good story from aspects of the novel prepare learners for literary criticism s chandrasekhar's lecture patterns of creativity explores the relationship between poetry and science g n devi's tribal verse in another strain 
familiarizes students with recent trends in looking at literature from non-conventional standpoints, bringing in oral folk traditions into its fold. Kumuduni Lakia's autobiographical extract from Women Who Dared gives expression to an artist's approach to life and art. The tasks that follow the essays demand learners' engagement with the texts and lead them on to a deep understanding of life and language. Teachers should help learners move towards reading with discernment. The following are recommended for additional reading. The Outsider by Albert Camus. A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen. Pygmalion by G.B. Shaw and Dancing in Cambodia and Other Stories by Amitav Ghosh. It is hoped that this course will lay the foundations for a study of English language and literature at the tertiary level of education. Page 1 Short Stories Introduction A short story is a brief work of prose fiction. It has a plot which may be comic, tragic, romantic or satiric. The story is presented to us from one of the many available points of view and it may be written in the mode of fantasy, realism or naturalism. In the story of incident, the focus of interest is on the course and outcome of events, as in the Sherlock Holmes story. The story of character focuses on the state of mind and motivation or on the psychological and moral qualities of the protagonist as in Glory at Twilight. Chekhov's The Lament focuses on form. Nothing happens or seems to happen except an encounter and conversations. But the story becomes a revelation of deep sorrow. The short story differs from the novel in magnitude. The limitation of length imposes economy of management and in literary effects. However, a short story can also attain a fairly long and complex form, where it approaches the expansiveness of the novel, which you may find in the third and final continent in this unit. Page 2 Chapter 1 The Lament by Anton Chekhov Guess the meaning of these expressions from the context. Gingerbread horse Slough Snuffle as if he were on needles. It is twilight. A thick, wet snow is slowly twirling around the newly lighted street lamps and lying in soft, thin layers on roofs, on horses' backs, on people's shoulders and hats. The cab driver, Ayana Potapov, is quite white and looks like a phantom. He is bent double as far as a human body can bend double. He is seated on his box. He never makes a move. If a whole snowdrift fell on him, it seems as if he would not find it necessary to shake it off. His little horse is also quite white and remains motionless. Its immobility, its angularity and its straight wooden-looking legs, even close by, give it the appearance of a gingerbread horse worth a kopeck. It is, no doubt, plunged in deep thought. If you were snatched from the plough, from your usual grey surroundings, and were thrown into this slough full of monstrous lights, unceasing noise and hurrying people, you too would find it difficult not to think. Iona and his little horse have not moved from their place for a long while. They left their yard before dinner and up to now not a fair. The evening mist is descending over the town. The white lights of the lamps are replacing brighter rays and the hubbub of the street is getting louder. Cabby for Vibogwe! Suddenly hears Iona. Cabby! Iona jumps and through his snow-covered eyelashes sees an officer in a great coat with his hood over his head. Vibogwe! The officer repeats. Are you asleep, huh? Vibogwe! Page 3 With a nod of assent, Iona picks up the reins, in consequence of which, layers of snow slip off the horse's back and neck. The officer seats himself in the sleigh. The cab driver smacks his lips to encourage his horse. 
stretches out his neck like a swan, sits up and, more from habit than necessity, brandishes his whip. The little horse also stretches its neck, bends its wooden-looking legs and makes a move undecidedly. What are you doing, werewolf? is the exclamation Iona hears from the dark mass moving to and fro as soon as they have started. Where the devil are you going? To the right? You do not know how to drive? Keep to the right, calls the officer angrily. A coachman from a private carriage swears at him. A passerby who has run across the road and rubbed his shoulder against the horse's nose looks at him furiously as he sweeps the snow from his sleeve. Iona shifts about on his seat as if he were on needles, moves his elbows as if he were trying to keep his equilibrium and gasps about like someone suffocating who does not understand why and wherefore he is there. What scoundrels they all are, jokes the officer. One would think they had all entered into an agreement to jostle you or fall under your horse. Iona looks around at the officer and moves his lips. He evidently wants to say something, but the only sound that issues is a snuffle. What? asks the officer. Iona twists his mouth into a smile and, with an effort, says hoarsely, My son, Baron, died this week. Hmm, what did he die of? Iona turns with his whole body towards his fare and says, And who knows? They say high fever. He was three days in the hospital and then died. God's will be done. Turn round, the devil! Sounds from the darkness. Have you popped off, old doggy? Huh? Use your eyes! Go on, go on, says the officer. Otherwise, we shall not get there by tomorrow. Hurry up a bit. Page 4. The cab driver again stretches his neck, sits up and, with a bad grace, brandishes his whip. Several times again, he turns to look at his fare, but the latter has closed his eyes and, apparently, is not disposed to listen. Having deposited the officer in the Wibog, he stops by the tavern, doubles himself up on his seat and again remains motionless, while the snow once more begins to cover him and his horse. An hour and another, then along the footpath with a squeak of galoshes and quarrelling come three young men, two of them tall and lanky, the third one short and humpbacked. Cabby, to the police bridge, in a cracked voice, calls the humpback. The three of us for two griveniks. Iona picks up his reins and smacks his lips. Two griveniks is not a fair price, but he does not mind whether it is a rouble or five kopecks. To him, it is all the same now, so long as they are fares. The young men, jostling each other and using bad language, approach the sleigh, and all three at once try to get onto the seat. Then begins a discussion as to which two shall sit and who shall be the one to stand. After wrangling, abusing each other and much petulance, it is at last decided that the humpback shall stand as he is the smallest. Now then, hurry up! says the humpback in a twagging voice and he takes his place and breathes in Iona's neck. Old furry, here, mate, what a cap you have. There is not a worse one to be found in all Petersburg. He he he, he he he, giggles Iona. Such a... Now you, such a... Hurry up. Are you going the whole way at this pace? Are you... Do you want it in the neck? My head feels like bursting, says one of the lanky ones. Last night at the Donk Masov's, Vaska and I drank the whole of four bottles of cognac. I don't understand what you lie for, says the other lanky one angrily. You lie like a brute. 
God strike me, it's the truth. It's as much the truth as that a louse coughs. He <laughs> he, grins Iona. What gay young gentleman? Sure, go to the devil, says the humpback indignantly. Are you going to get on or not, ye old pest? Is that the way to drive? Use the whip a bit. Go on, devil, go on. Give it to him well. Page number five. Iona feels at his back the little man wriggling and the tremble in his voice. He listens to the insults hurled at him, sees the people, and little by little the feeling of loneliness leaves him. The hump back goes on swearing until he gets mixed up in some elaborate six foot oath or chokes with coughing. The lankies begin to talk about a certain Nadejka Petrovna. Iona looks around at them several times. He waits for a temporary silence. Then, turning round again, he murmurs, My son died this week. We must all die, sighs the humpback, wiping his lips after an attack of coughing. Now hurry up, hurry up. Gentlemen, I really cannot go any farther like this. When will he get us there? Well, just you stimulate him a little in the neck. You old pest, do you hear? I'll bone your neck for you. If one treated the like of you with ceremony, one would have to go on foot. Do you hear, old serpent Gorinich? Or do you not care a spit? Iona hears rather than feels the blow they deal him. He <laughs> he, he laughs. They are gay young gentlemen. God bless them. Cabby, are you married? asks a lanky one. I? He <laughs> he, gay young gentleman. Now I have only a wife and a moist ground. He <laughs> ho ho, that is to say, the grave. My son has died, and I am alive. A wonderful thing. Death mistook the door. Instead of coming to me, it went to my son. Iona turns round to tell them how his son died. But at this moment, the humpback, giving a little sigh, announces, Thank God, we have at last reached our destination. And Iona watches them disappear through the dark entrance. Once more, he is alone and again surrounded by silence. His grief which has abated for a short while, returns and rends his heart with greater force. With an anxious and hurried look, he searches among the crowds passing on either side of the street to find whether there may be just one person who will listen to him. But the crowds hurry by without noticing him or his trouble. Page number 6 Yet it is such an immense, illimitable grief. Should his heart break and the grief pour out, it would flow over the whole earth. So it seems, and yet no one sees it. It has managed to conceal itself in such an insignificant shell that no one can see it even by day and with a light. Iona sees a hall porter with some sacking and decides to talk to him. Friend, what sort of time is it? he asks. Past nine. What are you standing here for? Move on. Iona moves on a few steps, doubles himself up and abandons himself to his grief. He sees it is useless to turn to people for help. In less than five minutes, he straightens himself, holds up his head as if he felt some sharp pain and gives a tug at the reins. He can bear it no longer. The stables he thinks, and the little horse, as if it understood, starts off at a trot. About an hour and a half later, Iona is seated by a large dirty stove. Around the stove, on the floor, on the benches, people are snoring. The air is thick and suffocatingly hot. Iona looks at the sleepers, scratches himself and regrets having returned so early. I have not even earned my fodder, he thinks. That's what's my trouble. A man who knows his job, who has had enough to eat 
and his horse too can always sleep peacefully a young cab driver in one of the corners half gets up grunts sleepily and stretches towards a bucket of water do you want a drink iona asks him don't i want a drink that's so your good health but listen mate you know my son is dead did you hear this week in the hospital it's a long story iona looks to see what effect his words have but sees none the young man has hidden his face and is fast asleep again the old man sighs and scratches his head just as much as the young one wants to drink the old man wants to talk it will soon be a week since his son died and he has not been able to speak about it properly to anyone one must tell it slowly and carefully how his son fell ill how he suffered what he said before he died how he died page number 7 one must describe every detail of the funeral and the journey to the hospital to fetch the dead son's clothes his daughter anisia has remained in the village one must talk about her too it is nothing he has to tell surely the listener would gasp and sigh and sympathize with him it is better too to talk to women two words are enough to make them sob i'll go and look after my horse thanks ayona there's always time to sleep no fear of that he puts on his coat and goes to the stable to his horse he thinks of the corn the hay the weather when he is alone he dare not think of his son he can speak about him to anyone but to think of him and picture him to himself is unbearably painful are you tucking in iona asks his horse looking at its bright eyes go on tuck in though we have not earned our corn we can eat hay yes i am too old to drive my son could have not i he was a first rate cab driver if only he had lived iona is silent for a moment then continues that's how it is my old horse there's no more kuzma ionich he has left us to live and he went off pop now let's say you had a foal you were the foal's mother and suddenly let's say that foal went and left you to live after him it would be sad wouldn't it the little horse munches listens and breathes over its master's hand Iona's feelings are too much for him and he tells the little horse the whole story about the author Anton Chekhov 1810 to 1904 was born in a middle class family in Russia he studied medicine at Moscow University his first short story appeared in 1880 and in the next 7 years he produced more than 600 stories page number 8 he also wrote plays seagull uncle vanya the three sisters and the cherry orchards are among the more famous ones his work greatly influenced the modern short story and drama the main theme of chekhov's short stories is life's pathos caused by the inability of human beings to respond to or even to communicate with one another the present story illustrates this point beautifully understanding the text 1 comment on the indifference that meets iona's attempts to share his grief with his fellow human beings 2 what impression of the character of iona do you get from the story 3 how does the horse serve as a true friend and companion to iona talking about the text discuss the following in pairs 1 empathy and understanding are going out of modern society the individual experiences intense alienation from the society around him or her 2 behind the public face of the people in various occupations is a whole saga of personal suffering and joy 
which they wish to share with others. Appreciation 1. The story begins with a description of the setting. How does this serve as a fitting prelude to the events described in the story? 2. Comment on the graphic detail with which the various passengers who took Iona's cab are described. 3. This short story revolves around a single important event. Discuss how the narrative is woven around this central fact. 4. The story begins and ends with Iona and his horse. Comment on the significance of this to the plot of the story. Page number 9. Language work. 1. Listen to the following words and mention what is common to them, both in form and meaning. Snuffle. Snort. Sniffle. Snore. 2. Listen to these words. Snigger. Squawk. Giggle. Sigh. Scramble. Gasp. Wriggle. Titter. Jeer. Siddle. Croak. Sneak. Pant. Shuttle. Boo. Straggle. Squeak. Chuckle. Guffaw. Shriek. Plod. Now, classify them according to their closeness in meaning to these words. A. Snigger. B. Wriggle. C. Squeak. D. Jeer. E. Sigh. 3. Explain the associations that the colour white has in the story. 4. What does the phrase, as if he were on needles, mean? Can you think of another phrase with a similar meaning, substituting the word needles? Suggested reading. 1. What men live by, by Leo Tolstoy. 2. The Overcoat, by N. Gogol.